welcome to episode 38. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. It's a new year, and if you're like me, you are already thinking about warmer weather and taking that getaway to that tropical or exotic destination. Maybe you plan to travel to Walt Disney World or Universal Studios. No matter what kind of trip you plan, 3D Travel Company is the company for you. Just visit 3DTravelCompany.com and let them know that Trenton sent you from Who Did That Voice. Or you can book on www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Book today and travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest hails all the way from Dimension X. He's Krang from the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is Krang. Report to me at once. My legions are waiting in Dimension X to storm into this world and crush it. Today's special guest hails all the way from Gotham City. That's right, folks. He's the lovable Batmite from Batman the Animated Series. Greetings, dynamic duo. I'm your biggest fan. What is it? I just want to help. Just want to help. Just want to help. If you're a fan of the show Tailspin, then you will probably remember this character. Wildcat was the jolly, kind-hearted, inventive mechanic. Yeah, what if you wiped out and fell down and bumped your head or something? Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have Pat Fraley joining us. Pat, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's just a pleasure. I, I love interviews because I'm an actor and we all you know like to talk about ourselves. <laughs> so it works out for me. Well, Pat, it is an absolute honor to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time. You know, the very first thing we always like to do when we start our show off is to get a little background on who our special guest is. So if we could learn a little bit about who you were growing up into the man you became and how did you get into voiceover? Well, I was a middle class, or still am, a middle class white boy. I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I don't recall a time, Trenton, in any age where I thought, oh, I'll be a, uh, a pilot or a fireman or a policeman. It was always a performer. I can't remember a time when I didn't. In fact, I've been a teacher performer for 44 years. And when I was four years old, I was the kid that was teaching the other kids how to die really good. <laughs> no, no, arch your back and kind of spit some. So, of course, they loved shooting me because they got a real good kill when we were playing cowboys and Indians. <laughs> and uh, so what a, what a boy did when he wanted to be a performer was go into theater. That was the only thing available when I was a boy because... Uh, this was the 60s. And so I went all through college and got a master's in fine arts and acting all the way through and started doing Shakespeare. And uh, I was encouraged, by the way, by my family. My mother was such an encourager. She, she was the one that goaded me on. And my father was behind me, too. Not as much as my mom, but she, he was with it. Yeah. So I started my career in Australia. I am a great right out of school. Why? Because you couldn't get a job in theater in those days when I got out. And uh, I wanted to do Shakespeare, so I went to Australia. I emigrated. I was the only American, young American there. Uh, Mel Gibson was there. He's American, but he was still in school. He's four years younger than I. So I was there, the only one. Didn't do a lot of American dialects, except when it came to doing voices and I'll get to that. So here I am doing Shakespeare in a repertory company and, uh, they call the theater and ask for someone that does an impression of James Cagney, you know, Jimmy Cagney. 
And they went, oh, yeah, we got a yank in the company because they figure we all sit around and do impressions of each other. <laughs> That's what Americans do. So I went in. I was on the way out, and they went, oh, we like you. And I went, really? Why? And they said, oh, you're so big. We can't get the other actors to be that big. And, of course, Trenton, for the last, you know, oh, long time, I was always told, oh, less, Pat, less, because I'm a very exaggerated guy. Yeah. I grew up around the deaf because my grandfather taught the deaf uh, in state schools, and so my whole family was very exaggerated. And so I thought, well, really, I'm big and they like it? Well, I, about four years later, I did my first job in Los Angeles at Hanna-Barbera, which was an animation company back in the day. I did a Scooby-Doo. That was my first show. And uh, that was that's how it kind of came about. I trained to be an actor. I got into voiceover. I, I didn't even know what it was. I don't think he even had a term for it in Australia. But when I came back to the States, I started freelancing a little bit in my hometown. And I came to Los Angeles at 30, and I was... I was skilled and prepared, and that uh, that helped. Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic to hear that you were able to travel abroad at a younger age because it's always wonderful when you get to explore other parts of the world and learn from different cultures because it definitely helps broaden your perspective as a person and as an actor. You're right on both counts, Trenton. First, as a, as a, as a person, because this was the time when Nixon was kicked out. It was during the Vietnam War. It was winding down. And so um, it gave me a different perspective on America because you hear the good, the bad, the ugly from abroad. Yeah. Their news is different than ours. It also uh, expanded my, my perception of performance because when you have a different nationality doing the same things and you see the sameness of what's needful in performance, uh, that's a very valuable tool. And also my students, because I was teaching in a university, as well as uh, doing um, repertory company work and voiceover, they insisted on me breaking down what I was doing with my voice to come up with characters. And that was the beginning of a a lifetime of teaching, and particularly with character voice, because I'm not historic for much, but I was the first in the world to deconstruct the character voice down to its elements, all thanks to some very curious students. Wow. That's very interesting to learn, Pat, because I know that you do teach, but I didn't realize that you are the one that, you know, initially started that, that format of teaching, which is fantastic to learn. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, well, gosh, what a blessing. I mean, I had no idea. I deconstructed uh, the voice because they were curious. And what I found out was when I came to Austra- or to Los Angeles some five years later, I guess it was, or six, I found out that's what the pros were doing. They, they would mix and match elements of a character voice, but intuitively, because no one really was teaching voiceover at that time. Dawes Butler was, but didn't teach that way of how to deconstruct. And you really have to deconstruct to teach any uh, any discipline. And so it just happened that it worked well for students and worked well for me as a performer uh, from from the time that I arrived in Los Angeles. Well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm really appreciative for you sharing that with us and kind of giving us the background on who you are and, you know, diving into who you are as an actor as well. Uh, you know, it's just fantastic to learn about you. And, you know, back in 1987, Pat, you actually got to play on a show that has become legendary. Uh, and that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And what was it like being a part of that show and playing such a diverse amount of characters on that show that had different variations in their tonage and, and construction? Correction, Trenton. It was the story of Krang. <laughs> yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles gave us a, quite a workout. And what a, what a great thing to be nine years sitting once a week next to Rob Paulson, who I sat next to, because we were always troublemakers. We were in the back <laughs> of the room. And, uh, t- and, and partially, it was such a great experience because uh, Fred Wolf, the producer, was, let's call it, thrifty. Now, in those days, they didn't have stars that came into cartoon shows to guest. Yeah. But they did hire guests to come in 
to fulfill roles. Oh, no. Fred had to do everything. If they said, okay, who's light on the contract? Meaning, in those days, you got three voices for a TV show for the price of one on the union contract. So if we had two voices, not three, we'd raise our hand and go, okay, you're the Asian professor. <laughs> and I go, I, I don't do Asian. You do now. <laughs> so we really had to scramble to come up with all the characters and the guests and the ancillary characters that the writers would uh, introduce. And sometimes they were reoccurring. Sometimes they were one shots. But that was uh, that was quite a, a learning lesson and such a delight to go somewhere once a week for those many years. Because when you think about it, Trenton, even uh, friends or shows that went six years, they never had that much time spent with a cast. Yeah. So it was quite unusual in that era uh, because there was so much animation and so few performers that could do three different characters over and over again in a series. It was quite a quite a great time to uh, uh, in my salad days to start that way. Absolutely. I started in 19... Actually, Trenton, I, got, I, I came to town, and this might be helpful to, to people thinking about that kind of thing, if they have a mind to come to Los Angeles or New York. Cause I, I took me three years to get a regular role on a cartoon show. I guessed here and there, but it was real spotty. Yeah. Here's what saved me. Before I came down, I had the presence of mind to save money. So when I came down, I didn't have to immediately go in and work in a restaurant or work in a service area. I could hang out with the other actors. And so they go, hey, you want lunch? I go, sure. And so I hung out enough that they thought I was like the, all the, the other professional actors. I had time on my hands because we all did. We'd have a session, three hours, and then we were off for the day sometimes. Yeah. And so I guess they got the impression, oh, he's a working actor. So they started recommending me and my career started to get some traction. Wow. So I guess the lesson, at least the way I did it was save some money so you can kind of, you know, hang with the different actors and producers. And that was helpful. Absolutely. Well, as you kind of previewed for us, you gave us a little bit of Krang. And how did you construct Krang? Where did that voice come from? Because it is definitely an extremely unique voice. <laughs> yeah, and I had, believe me, you know, I always tell people to have a little repertory company you drag into auditions so you know what you're doing. Well, in this case, you know, I had, the description was a, a pink, burbling blob of a brain, but funny, and I had nothing. And so I looked at all the different aspects of the character that were written in the description, and I just put together what I had learned and taught, and that was to break a character down to its elements. So I put together, oh, well, he's a villain, so I'll make him, I'll give him a high pitch raise, so he can be very low and very high. Oh, a pitch characteristic, he's a blob, so I'll make him kind of a a puffy pitch characteristic and place the voice in the back of the throat and he's undulating. Well, I'll do kind of a cap and pepper thing. And so he's got this range, right? And then yeah. I thought, okay. Then I thought, well, what if he, at the time I had little boys and I would get so upset sometimes. We had four boys in five years. <laughs> oh, wow. so I had them all over the place. And so I was always getting frustrated and going, okay, you boys go out there and clean the pool. And I'd get acid indigestion when I'd yell at them. <laughs> and I thought, what if I, you know, do that every so often? I'm talking as crap. And I do that. Well, I thought, yeah, good idea, but they won't let me do that between the lines. I have to do it on the lines. So it was a trick I learned probably in third grade. How to talk backwards. <laughs> so I have that ability. So what I was known for with Krang is I, I'd go, Oh, what a wonderful day to rule the universe. <laughs> and then the, the final touch for the audition, and I only had a couple of minutes to put it together, was it said he's funny. Well, I thought, underneath all that, how about I make him like a long-suffering Jewish mother? <laughs> so we get the line, like, this is what I get for surrounding myself with idiots. 
so it would be, it'd come out. This is what I said for surrounding myself with idiots. <laughs> you hear the little uh, lilt in there? Yeah, I do. I Wait, do. go fine. Go ahead, try to see if I care. <laughs> and so wow. it was a little secret, but it seemed to work well for being a comedic villain. Absolutely. I would wholeheartedly agree with you on that. You know, and you also played, I believe, uh, Baxter Stockman and Slash the Turtle and Casey Jones as well. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Slash the Turtle. He was a crazy turtle. <laughs> and, I, and he had splayed out teeth in the design. So I knew I had to do something with my S's. And I thought, well, who's really passionate and kind of crazy? Kirk Douglas. <laughs> Kirk Douglas always had this kind of angst and he was always so passionate so I combined the two and came up with Slash and we had to work fast so we really did come up with notions we'd get the design sheet at the session where we were to perform in minutes and so we had to go well you know we really had to throw it against the wall Yeah. Uh, for um, back to Stockman I just raised my pitch and then I'd wiggle my throat. And what I'm doing with my hand is wiggling on my throat. So Baxter Stockman was a fly guy. <laughs> to give so it I that fly little, sound. Ah. I remember <laughs> so often. Wow. And when I was originally cast, I thought he'd be a regular, but he was only, I can't recall, but he, he only lasted for a few shows and then he died, didn't he? You know, I don't recall him being in it very much, but he no. was a character that was very memorable for sure, so... Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I, when I um, meet fans, a lot of times they'll mention Baxter. He's a wonderful character. Yeah. And then you mentioned what? Another one, Casey Jones? Casey Jones, yeah. That was just my bad Jim Eastwood. Hello, <laughs> Violator. And, of course, I was higher in my pitch. I've lowered over the years, but uh, just the combination of my voice and thinking Clint Eastwood is what I came up with. Uh, when I meet fans and get to interact, Casey Jones is a very popular character. I also think that they have uh, advanced and that character in all mediums of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, in the movies, in the new series. He seemed to uh, have good traction to change cultures and periods, and so that's part of it, too. Absolutely. Yeah, his character has definitely blossomed and grown over the years, and I think they really have invested more time into his backstory and developing him as the reincarnations of Turtles comes out. So Right, and, and uh, things since things have gotten darker in most all mediums as far as characterization and writing, somehow the hockey mask and all that worked for that so he could get kind of dark. Yeah. Whereas before he wasn't really dark at all. He just wore the mask so they wouldn't know who he was. Yeah, it was just kind of a way to hide his face, and now it's kind of a more fits in with the culture kind of thing. So Yeah. Well, what was it like, you know, getting to do voiceover? You've done a lot of different things, Pat, and we've just barely touched the surface. But one of the things you got to voice was the Hobgoblin for Universal Studios' ride, The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man. What was it like getting to be a voice for something that people would get to ride on a daily basis multiple times a day? Well, that's such a joy. Uh, first of all, let me say that there was a great casting person. There was Arthur Hiller, a director, okay. a very well-known director. We've lost him. And Lynn Stallmaster, who he was, he cast so much stuff. And these two guys were given the uh, role of casting this thing. And it was for, I think it's for Florida. Yes. I think it's for, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I got it. And what's wonderful about it is the longevity. I also do Buzz Lightyear for the uh, the ride or the event at Disney. Oh, wow. And I think it's called Photon Blasters. And so I introduce as they come in, and so many people have been able to listen to that. And so when you do the voice for a ride, it's like this forever, well, for a long time job that people can reference, and that's kind of a delight. Absolutely. I didn't realize you, I knew you'd played Buzz Lightyear in some other children's books and games and things, but I did not realize you had actually played Buzz Lightyear for the ride there at Disney as well. Yeah, I, uh, I did for nine years, I did Buzz Lightyear with Tim Allen. Oh, wow. He was very busy at the time, and so I did all the toys, most all of them, uh, rides, 
commercials. I even worked with him on Toy Story 2 doing some uh, exertion sounds because Tim wasn't uh, crazy about doing it. And so, and he also would get a little rude in his ad libs, <laughs> you know. And so what happened was uh, John Lasseter, who's the head of Pixar at the time, and, and, and uh, this great genius would have me come in and he called me Buzz Light because <laughs> I'd clean up his tracks. And uh, so I had a great ride for nine years doing um, Buzz Lightyear. Goodness. To infinity and residuals. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic. And that is something I didn't know. And I love when I'm able to learn something that's unexpected. And it always makes the, uh, the time with my special guest more uh, special. <laughs> but, well, uh, you know, uh, just to go on just for a moment. Yeah. Uh, most all our working actors have a sound like. And they sometimes uh, add lines to a film when the actor turns his head and that actor is not available, or, or a lot of times scratch tracks because the producers only have those actors to do post-production where they add voices and change voices after the principal photography. They only have them for a limited time. So during the course of creating a film, the writer may want to need to hear a different line uh, producers need to see scenes to get uh, excited, and the sound like does all that. And then the, uh, it's a scratch track. And then, then when they finally get them in for the limited time, the valuable time with the star, then they they replace everything or little things. But sometimes in movies they don't. There's a person that does the sound like for major parts of the film. That happens. Well, that's cool to know that, you know, there are different people that you actually voice for the main stars and do those scratch tracks. That's very unique and, and very special. I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Sure. Well, you know, one of my all-time favorite shows, and Ninja Turtles is absolutely one of my all-time favorites, but one of my other all-time favorite shows that you've been on and that I didn't realize until more recently doing my research for this interview was that you were on Tailspin, and I absolutely love your character that you play on there, Wildcat. Tell us a little bit about him and how did that voice come about? Well, that's one of my favorite shows, too, Trenton, for a couple reasons. First of all, they were having a difficulty casting it because the character is a mountain lion, and he had a prognathic or jutting jaw that made him look like he would be big. And so everybody who was coming in stupid was in the making him big. And I knew they had a problem, and I thought, well, what if he's naive instead of stupid? Yeah. And maybe his voice is very high. It's kind of like, below is just a wrench or a banana. I forget. <laughs> oh, look, there's a new uh, island on the map. No, that's guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> so I made him very simple and delightful and, and kind of childish. Yeah. Okay. And, and I love doing it. And, the, and Disney gave me a lot of room to ad lib a bit and time for my character to put together thoughts. And here's why it's so meaningful to me, Trenton. About 20 years later, I started getting calls from psychologists and from fans who uh, were challenged. Uh, autism, what they used to call Asperger's, um, but, but uh, ADHD, difficulties, yeah. you know, challenges. Yeah. Now, these kids, when they were little, would get on a bus and go to a public school because they had resources for challenged kids and, and classes. And, of course, they'd get teased and humiliated by kids. So they'd come home after school. They'd watch that show and others, but they watched that show, and they perceived Wildcat as being challenged, and all the other lo characters loved him. And so it meant a lot to some students that I'm still, or not students, uh, fans, that I'm still in touch with. And, and, and putting aside the fact that they would come home and maybe watch G.I. Joe and just escape into some place that was away from their reality. Yeah, definitely. But that, that made what I did more meaningful. Because, you know, after all, most of what I do my entire life is to amuse people. Well, you can see where this has more depth. Absolutely. Now, here's, here's an added thing. I didn't know it at the time, but... Uh, the sound of Wildcat, and then there's another character I played, Loki in Rainbow Bright, so what a wonderful day in Rainbow Bright. <laughs> Here again, a simple character. Now, get this. I didn't know it, but what I was accessing, as actors do, 
their past and people they've met, and that that is a resource tool for coming up with things. Well, I grew up around the deaf. As I mentioned, my grandfather taught the deaf and blind as a superintendent of state schools in North Dakota and then Idaho. Yes. I was around a lot of deaf kids, and lots of them were challenged as well. And if you listen to the tone of a deaf person, Dougie, where they, they don't hear tone, and so they talk like this, well, you can hear that kind of and wild cat lurking. Yeah. Can't you? Yeah, I can. Now, I wasn't making fun of them. I was accessing what I knew. And so it, it, it even enhanced and thickened my my interest in what ha- occurred. But it didn't come to me for years that that perhaps was an aspect of those characters. Sometimes the things that we end up doing, you know, in that in the world of acting, when you're pulling from those different resources, you you just don't realize where the source came from, but it came through your life experiences. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, as I mentioned, we had to work so fast and come up with ideas fast. That, yeah. Uh, I didn't sit down and go, where did you get this and what? And I certainly had no agenda to make fun of challenged people. But here's the good news. Those characters were beloved, and so they were never put down. And so that's one thing that uh, gives me a respect and uh, gives me pause to say, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's very wonderful. I'm glad that you were able to share that with us and that he is such a, an important character to you and that he's meant so much to so many people, especially those who deal with certain challenges in their lives. You know, Pat, I've always wondered, what was it like for you to work on Denver, The Last Dinosaur? You know, dinosaurs were definitely big back in the 80s. And uh, oh, is, yeah. that is one of my absolute favorite shows. The theme song for that was just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, Tom Burton, who produced it, was a musician. He wrote that as well. Well, that was an interesting circumstance because I was called in an audition, and he's a, I think, brontosaurus, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Little head, big body. Yeah. Well, they said, <laughs> we want a big voice. And I said, no, he's got a little head. That's where it comes from. Forget the big part. It's his head. And so I went, wow, he chips, wow, <laughs> and went high. And they never really gave him full lines. He just had sounds and reactions. And so it was an unusual uh, circumstance to record. And it's the only time that I worked completely off the storyboards. In those days, they had storyboards. They still do. But I actually got copies of the storyboards, and they would be about two inches thick. Wow. And I would go through and circle the pictures and choose the voice, the sound that he'd make or the, the little snap of a little teeny piece of dialogue. And that's the way I had to go through the process uh, when I prepared for each show. And so it was unusual that way. But that was, a, that was a delight to do. I mean, I keep saying delight because my entire career has been a delight. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't imagine. I mean, not only was it a delight, but for some reason... I got a lot of characters that either spoke very little lines but had sound effects, or, well, for example, Cousin It. Wow, she is a nut. Wow. You know, <laughs> or um, the Worm Guys in Men in Black. I did this six year cartoon animated series where they, you know, spoke like, gotta get a job, a cafe latte grande. <laughs> they had very little dialogue. And so I've had kind of the best. Uh, of the best, at least for me, because what I found out when I was young, is that, oh, not young, when I got to be in high school, I discovered I had a reading disorder, or it came about, which I've had my entire career. Wow. And I thought, well, here I am. I pick a, a performance, or I pick a, a job where my job is to read, and I can't read. <laughs> so my whole process, when I do have to read, it's longer than other people's. But what I discovered recently was, oh, I relate to sound, not words. And that's the difference. Is that, and so the sound of a word uh, and the onomatopoetic aspect of where a word sounds like what it is, buzz, slip, you know, and I would do that to all words, really is central to my modicum of success. Yeah, certainly in animation where it it becomes more evocative. I make the words juicier. So uh, that, that that that's kind of an interesting uh, aspect to my career. 
I think, is that here's a guy that has a reading disorder that's had a flourishing career. Who knew? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, would your reading disorder by any chance be dyslexia, or is it considered something else? It's duplexic, which means I can't read, and then when I can read, I don't understand what the words are because I'm stupid. <laughs> well, I, I have dyslexia. No, actually, so. actually, it's kind of, it's a, I guess it's a behavioral aspect, too. It's the way my mind works as well as my reading of words. Okay. I get ahead of myself when I talk. Yeah. And I, that transfers or is connected with getting ahead when I'm reading a sentence. And so I have to uh, work it. It's kind of interesting because when I first came to town and a lot of the work I did was on commercials and ha I had dialogue and or text, a lot of text. Well, I'd get in the studio, and I'd realize as I'm right, reading a line that I'm going to make a mistake. I just knew it was going to happen. And so I would stop and go, hey, I've got an idea. Let me take that again. And I was lying. I was protecting myself. Yeah. So I'd go back to the beginning of the sentence, and by gosh, I would have a better idea. I guess the pressure or, you know, just, you know, doing it a slight different way. I would also do things like I'd get in the middle of a, a sentence and I'd lose my diction. So I'm talking along and I'd do that, you know. And I'd go and I'd stop and go, oh, no, i got Henry Fina disease. I have no consonants. Help <laughs> me. And, of course, they'd laugh. And then also the third aspect of my reading disorder, or people that have one, is when they're reading a sentence sometimes, They'll they'll read it wrong, but make it make sense. Yeah, you know what I mean. I they do. change the syntax of the sentence, but when it came out, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, here's what happened, Trenton. I got this reputation for being ultra confident because it's a lot of confidence to stop in the middle and make a joke of what you're doing and then move on. That shows a confidence. Yeah. Humor shows confidence that you you can make fun of yourself. I also got an idea of being very spontaneous because I'd get good ideas in the middle of a sentence and go back. And uh, finally, uh, the, the whole idea, well, you get the idea. Yeah. I got this, oh, because I changed words to that. Well, he works loose. I mean, he's not concerned about getting every word. Yeah, we'll get it the way we want it, we want, but I like the way he did it. So I got this reputation. And it was all, it, uh, totally based on me hiding my, my uh, inability and my, my challenge. And so when I found that out after a few years, I thought, well, I'll, I'll work that. Why not? <laughs> I mean, the idea that they like it, that I stop and make jokes, and they like it when I change my mind. So I, I folded that into my, my skill set. And then eventually, after about 15 years, I remember vaguely being in a session and I messed up a sentence and I just stopped and went, look, you guys, I, I have this reading disorder. What are you going to do? Fire me? I already have a career. <laughs> and they just laughed because they really, the one thing that is important for all of anybody listening with a reading disorder is that they don't really care. They just want to get the product good at the end. Then working with stars my whole career, they always take more takes than we do. These we pros in it. And so that was an encouragement too, that it's okay to take some time to enjoy yourself, to go back and chew it a line and make it right. It's a process. And so that helped me a great deal too. It gave me a confidence. And so I wasn't fear-based when I went into a session. Absolutely. Well, that is actually really encouraging to hear from you, Pat, because some of the struggles that you talk about are struggles I had growing up as a dyslexic. And um, oh, so I really, I really appreciate that. Yeah, gosh. And back, back in the day, it was just, that's just being stupid. Yeah. Really. They didn't have the term dyslexia or reading disorder or anything. No, they didn't. And I remember going uh, my first week, uh, I was, uh, given a, a scholarship and a living wage to go to school at Cornell University in the Master of Fine Arts program in acting. So here I am. I mean, you know, the pressure's on. They only took six of us out of the country. Wow. And so I, I remember trying to sneak over. I snuck over to the speed reading class they had, 
uh, in a building where they had a little bar that would, would you'd load and it would go down a page and you had to keep up with what it would show. It had a little window of one line and that was to teach you how to speed read. Well, I went in there and after two pages, I just went, oh no, I couldn't read anything. I was trying, because I thought, oh, now they're going to find out. But uh, somehow I was able to get through and get my degree. But uh, it, it, it certainly was not based on my reading ability. But one final thing that I think is of interest, Trenton, is that, and I just wrote this to a student who said, I have a problem reading. And I said, you know what? Your process is going to take more time than others. You're going to have to rehearse more. But the good news is that you can not rely on reading skills for acting skills. Absolutely. A good reader can read and make it sound like they know what they're reading when they don't. But a person with dyslexia or reading disorder has to understand what it is and sort of make it a dance. Yeah. You get that? You kind of have to get the rhythm of the line and then you can do it. Do you get that? Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. Take, totally yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It has to be sort of a song. Every line is sort of has its own rhythm and tempo and and so and, and meaning. And so I think it's a it's kind of an odd advantage. I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> yeah. I it's really just is a matter of beating yourself up, which is not valuable and also understanding your journey is going to be more difficult than others, perhaps, because you're going to have to read lines four or five times before you perform them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to do high school theater, and I always had to work on my lines consistently because repetition was my key. So, Yeah, yeah me too. Hey, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying today's interview with Pat Fraley. You know, sadly, this is the end of part one, but we will return this Sunday for the conclusion Part 2 with Pat Fraley. You know, when he and I began chatting, I had no idea that Pat had a learning disability. It really hit home with me considering that I grew up with one as well. Dyslexia was always a real struggle for me. Maybe you struggle with a reading disability like dyslexia, or you struggle with something else. No matter what it is, I would love to hear from you. Whether you want to just say how awesome you thought the interview was, or you just want to say hi, or maybe it really resonates with you what we're talking about today. Not only have we been talking about some amazing voiceover stories and some amazing animations, but we've also talked about some real issues in life that even if you struggle with a disability, it doesn't mean that you can't reach for the stars and accomplish any dream that you set your mind to. I hope you guys contact me. Just go to www.whodidthatvoice.co, go to the contact me page and send me a message. I hope to hear from you soon. We'll see you guys later. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. I know it's sad, but we'll be back this Sunday for part two with Pat Fraley. Hey, do you ask yourself, who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.